Our guest today is an exciting young director who's currently working with the iconic Sam Raimi on an undisclosed horror movie. But how did he get to this point? Well, he wrote and directed his first feature film, age 17, called Strings. He followed this up with a number of TV and advert projects, including Sky Atlantic's Britannia and AMC's Soulmates. But it was his short film that caught horror fans' imaginations, critically acclaimed Dawn of the Death. This led him to direct the breakout horror movie, Host, and his new movie, Dash Cam, set for release in June. Our guest today is Rob Savage. So how how did this, I mean, this interest, obviously now that you're you're directing and writing mm. and, and you've been doing this a while now, how did this all begin? Were there friends, family, people that you, that influenced you mm. early on? Well, none, none of my family were, had anything to do with the film industry. You know, I come from a, a, a farming family in, in Shropshire and my interest really started with comic books. Uh, you know, I was always the art kid drawing at the back of class and, um, you know, it was kind of illustration design was something that I maybe saw myself doing. And there was this guy who lived around the corner from me who, who was actually the, the guy who draws the walking dead comics. So I kind of had this little bit of an insight into that industry through him. And he was always hanging out at the local comic book store. And I, you know, I kind of ask him questions and show him my stuff. And uh, it was really, it was when I saw my, my dad showed me Akira, the, the classic anime movie, uh, when I was like 14 or 15 and you know I kind of got an interest I kind of it kind of that kind of started to bridge my interest in comic books and illustration into you know a, into a film space and I was kind of interested in the you know I was always I was always in, in my art trying to find a way to make what I was drawing feel dynamic and feel like it had a sense of movement and I was always interested in composition and just storytelling through through visuals um and and from you know from watching from watching akira i kind of got interested in um you know there's a lot of a lot of stuff akira was such an influential film i kind of went akira the matrix into you know in, in, into a kind of wider interest in film and i would you know i just kind of like i i, I can't remember exactly if it was a decision but i but i, I seem to go pretty I, I lean just pretty hard into film and be like, I guess this is what I'm doing. And I guess if I'm doing this, I should know everything about it. So I, you know, I started out um, setting myself like homework where I'd, I'd basically be like, well, this week I'm just watching, um, you know, uh, I'm just focusing on Soviet montage. So I'm going to watch Battleship Potemkin and Earth and all these, you know, and then next week I'm going to do Hitchcock and then I'm going to do Dario Argento. And I just say, I'd kind of just try and make sure that I was versed in everything. You know, I, I thought, I, I, you know, every, every, every time I'd kind of dive into a different, um, a different, uh, country's output or a different era of film, I'd find something that would, that would really charge me up and give me a, give me a new idea. And I'd, I'd, you know, I'd get a little flip camera and I'd try and replicate shots or I'd, I'd work in some of the cinema language that I was learning from these, um, from these films into just the, these kind of shitty short catch up blood slasher movies I was making with my friends. And, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, the films, the films kind of became progressively better or more competent at least. And, um, and then, you know, and then I started to, um, you know, I started, I started to think about it more seriously as a, as a, as a career. And I, you know, I, I sent off a couple of, a couple of my short films and they got into like really shitty pub basement, you know, projecting on a white sheet kind of festivals, mm -hmm. Um, but you know, that was huge for me at the time. Uh, and yeah, and then you know, towards the end of, towards the end of my A levels, you know, I don't know if you remember, but like at the end of your A levels, it's like you, you, you get like an extra couple of months of holiday cause you finish your A levels and you know, midway through the year. So I had this huge long summer before university and I kind of like, I'd saved a bit of money from, from doing the odd teenage job here and there. And, um, and it was like, I, either I'm just going to get really drunk for this whole summer or I could probably do something more worthwhile with it. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm living with my parents. I don't have to pay rent. I'm like, I, this is the most freedom I'm ever going to have again, probably. Uh, so I should probably do something with it. So I decided to decided to make a, a feature film 
I was seven, 17 at the time. And the, you know, the idea of making a feature film was really because I didn't know, I, I kind of didn't really know what shorts did. I'd made them because that was the, you know, uh, cause I was just fucking around, but I kind of didn't really, I didn't really fully understand that the industry expects you to make shorts to then make, you know, funded shorts or, you know, you know, to, to apply for the BFI and get a bit of funding and, and get, get those festival screenings in. And, and eventually, you know, after kind of proving yourself through a series of shorts, you get the feature and then, you know, and then from there you, you, you kind of enter into the industry proper. If you, if you're lucky enough to ever make a second feature as a lot of people aren't, I had no idea that there was like, that there are any kind of like pre-existing routes into the industry. I, all I knew is that, is that the movies that I watched were like 90 minute, two hour movies at the cinema. So I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a full length movie and I want to see it on a big screen eventually. And that's the plan. And if it's rubbish, if it's a piece of shit, I'll just pretend it never happened. I'll go to uni. I'll, you know, I'll find some other way in. And, um, and so, you know, over the course of that summer for whatever, 20, 20 days or whatever, me, me and a, a bunch of friends shot this movie, which, which would become strings, which is like this, this, this very weird uh, your first first feature that I that I made. So if it, I started it when I was eighteen, finished uh, started it when I was seventeen, finished it when I was eighteen, and um, it was kind of my like I kind of learned every ninety percent of everything that I know now. I learned during during the shooting of that and just having to figure everything out on the fly. Yeah. Wow, that's mad! You were so young when you did it, and you just did mm. it in your summer holidays. You were like, <laughs> "Fuck <laughs> it, why not give it a go?" Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a lot to be said for just being like, fuck it. And just and do it. Yeah. Just, just, just making the thing that you can make at that point, you know, just looking, literally looking around and being like, what can I make right now with just this? Mm -hmm. That was, um, yeah. I mean, I, I remember cause, um, I watched that film and it was because Tom Wetmore had done the sound on it. Yeah. And, and I, remember I think I was him... staying, staying on your sofa yeah. for, for a while. making yeah. that. And I remember him saying that, um, you know, he's like, Rob is going to be, he's going to be a big director one day. Like he's, he's amazing. He's great. And he was singing, singing your praises. Yeah. And at the time I didn't realize, God, you were 17. That is mad. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Was, and you, yeah. you are from memory. I'm mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember him saying you did, you operated on it. You edited it. You directed yeah. it. You did a bit of everything. Yeah. I was kind of a one man band for, for, for a large part. It was, um, I, you know, I, I wrote it, directed it, shot it, co-produced it. I did, um, yeah, I kind of did an anything that no one else wanted to do. Uh, I, I throw in, you know, and try and try and figure it out. Uh, you know, and it wasn't the intention, you know, originally I remember the very first day, uh, I, you know, I'd been like, well, I want this to be a professional movie. So I went through, the, I, I watched the credits of Boogie Nights and I was like writing down, I was like, oh, we're going to need a best boy, whatever that is. We're going to need this. We're gonna need that. And I got like all, got all my friends to come and help out and, and wrangle cables and just all this kind of bullshit. And the first day was such a nightmare. It was so embarrassing and so horrible. Like nothing, nothing worked and everything went slow and I didn't know what to do. And like everyone was standing around. There was such a kind of like oppressive energy with all these people standing around that didn't want to be there. And then the second day, nobody would answer my calls and, and nobody showed up. And it was just like, wow. you know, or, or just plain Tommy to go fuck myself. And, and basically like three people showed up and they became the crew for the rest of the movie. And it was great from there on it, from there on out, it was like, it was, it was still really tough and, and horrible at times and all this kind of stuff. But, um, but it worked, you know, it had, a, it had a momentum to it because there were the, there were three people there and they were all um, just, they were happy to take on any role just to get this thing done. <laughs> that's amazing it's one of those things as well because people always ask they're like how do you get into the industry how do you start what what is your and you literally just went i'm just gonna do it i'm just gonna make a film i've done a couple of shorts i'm gonna make a feature because yeah. no one really does it, that most people are like i'll do i'll do a short film and then yeah I'll get a feature somehow but that that's, that's i think fun. you've just yeah you've just got to be you've just got to be bold and and i expect more and more now like we were lucky i don't think i don't think it would happen um, we, we, we managed to, we managed to arrive at this, this very, um, this kind of pivotal point in the, in the industry where, you know, 
DSLRs, Canon, you know, the Canon 5D, whatever, all yeah. those cameras, they were just becoming readily available. And, and, you know, we didn't shoot, we actually shot just before they were available on, on um, an HDV camera, but it, it, the conversation at the time was, was being like, well, uh, anyone can shoot a movie now. And we became a kind of, we became the kind of poster child in a small way of, of, of that, of like, the, you know, the story of how we made the movie was more, was way more important than the movie itself. The movie itself is fine, but the, you know, we managed to ride that wave of this bunch of, this bunch of kids, you know, made a movie. It's, you know, it's, 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 okay, you know, it's pretty good. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, this is why every time I talk to film students, I'm like, don't, don't just go, don't just go and make a, fe make a feature film. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you know it's a different it's a different world now like you can go make a feature film if you feel like you've got something that's going to fucking blow people's heads off but um the main thing is to just do something it's to just do something that no one else is no one else is doing because there's so much noise now there's so much stuff getting made and there's so much good stuff like i feel i feel like i'm drowning in good tv and good movies and mm. it's just it's it's like really good well-made brilliant um interesting content I, I i mean i fucking hate the word content but like whatever like really good really good stuff is just disappearing without without a trace and it's fucked it's like it's um it's so it's so you know it's so hard you've got to be you can't just you can't just make something that's good you've got to make something that's noisy mm. um and i think you know back back then we kind of made a noise by being yeah by being by being one of the first first features made for no money by a bunch of kids i guess well, a lot of things in this industry are kind of it's timing isn't it and luck mm. and um obviously you hit a, a good time then and, and as you say like there's so many films now that just kind of disappear and you hear a bit about them and you know they can be in the cinema for less than a week and it's just gone um yeah an example like i would say i've actually heard today that they are getting it a cinema release now but the film with dev patel called the green knight yeah, Which looks really cool. Um, I, I saw great. it over here. Yeah, because I'm I'm over here in LA, so I saw it, I was able to see it. But ah. um, it's fucking great. Is it? I yeah. really want to see it. But they because they they were saying oh it was going to come out I think about three weeks ago and then they pulled it like last minute. Yeah. Um, but I saw today there was an article saying they've actually found it a release and it's going to be coming out in a couple of weeks here. So they are oh, going to get it. Yeah, see it but, on a, see it on a big screen. It's like it's it's like nothing else. Mm -mm. it looks insane man and what like dev patel is just a beast he's just yeah he's so good man it's so. crazy it's crazy how and 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 also like he's 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 become such a such an incredible actor because i remember seeing him in in skins yeah. originally and um and not thinking much of him in skins but then like he's like time after time like this yeah. and liar lion and fucking Oh, Lion's it's amazing. Yeah, Sunder he's yeah. yeah, he's such a weighty actor. Like he can do anything. I think. Mm. And it's funny, isn't it, when you look at I. I mean, particularly just I look at other actors. I'm mean, like follow people's careers, and mm. you see the ups and downs. And with him, like there was definitely a moment where he could have gone either way. Yeah. And you know, after Skins, and I don't know if you've have you heard the story about how Danny Boyle cast him for that. No. It's kind of crazy. It was um his daughter watch his skins and and he was kind yeah. of he was doing a load of castings for the film and he hadn't found anyone he wanted and and um his daughter was watching skins and she was like what about this guy who's in skins and showed him a clip and he was like okay and then he came in and he read for it and he obviously got the yeah. role and it's kind of just like just shows yeah. you doesn't it luck yeah timing. yeah um, yeah Time, exactly and you know he's amazing now but that's because he's had so much practice and he's been able to go off and do these amazing projects and yeah, he's been given that opportunity, isn't it? Um, yeah. And also just like, lean, just, just leaning into it as well. When you do get an opportunity and like, he's, he's, he's somebody who see, you know, seemingly, I, I mean, I don't know, but like, he seems so um, like he's so he, he wants to push the craft. He, you know, he's interested in, he's just interested in doing the work and, um, and, and just really, pushing himself and throwing himself in which you know sometimes you don't get that you know you see a lot of see a lot of actors who find their thing and they kind of live within that niche mm. which is which is fine as well but it's it's great to see an actor who's always trying to push themselves to the limit 100 percent. he's very um he's very versatile and his films he's not afraid he does things mm. that you go yeah that could have been a bit of a risk or you know yeah yeah um but he just goes for it um 
yeah, he's one of those guys that you kind of got to go. That's a good, that's a career that you want to template. You want to be that. That's, that's what you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's good, you know, and quality as well. Like he's not doing, he's not doing good performances in bad movies or mediocre movies. Like yeah. he's picking to work with really interesting directors on really interesting projects. And it's like, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's doing, you know, it's doing, doing really well for him, I think. Mm-hmm, definitely. I wanted to ask how, you know, obviously when you did, you did a load of shorts, you started off doing that and then you went off and you did strings. What was it like after that, the aftermath of, you know, doing mm. so much, I mean, so involved in one project and then trying to find the next thing. What was that process like? Uh, it was kind of like kind of painful. It was like, um, you know, I think it took me, it took me like five years to figure out what I didn't know, you know, because mm because making making strings i was doing i was doing everything and we managed to get you know a bit of a bit of noise and we got picked up for for distribution and we won a biffer and it was just like all the things that you wouldn't you know you'd never you'd never think for a movie like that because three grand and wow it was and three I was, grand that's three bad. grand yeah <laughs> and i was like you know and i was i was like 18 19 and i was just this like i was a very kind of um pretentious uh uh kids like full of full of full of unwarranted self-confidence and like um just being like oh i guess it's easy then i guess you just make a movie and it all goes you know it all goes your way and um you know and i even had when i was 19 right off the back of strings i had a second feature lined up and we had all the money there and it was like you know hundreds of thousands which you know isn't isn't a lot but like it was a you know it was a lot uh for me back then and we were like six weeks away from shooting we had an amazing cast we had a location in italy and then the money fell through and the project never happened and it all just went which is good because it was a shitty like it, i look back at it now and it's a bit cringe it's like i you know it's um it probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have gone very well it would have been a very weird like it, again it was kind of a weird kind of art housey low-key drama thing which is what it, kind of what strings was which isn't isn't really isn't really what i was interested in but it was kind of like this pretentious kid chasing prestige, but with, you know, but with zero life experience to back it up. So, um, but, but, you know, but it, but it was kind of this, this shock to the system of being like, Oh, well, what do I do now? Like I've moved to, I've moved from Shropshire to London and I've got to pay crazy rent. And I, I've, I've, I've basically made it. So I've got no other skill set but, but making films. Um, so I had to kind of work backwards, you know, I'd made a feature and then I had to, um, you know, I worked in commercials a little bit and I had to, um, I did music videos, but you know, the thing that I had to do was, was work on a bunch of short films to, to kind of get people to understand who I was as a filmmaker, which is, which is really the kind of, that's the point of making short films is to kind of get people on board with who you are and the kind of thing you want to go and make when you graduate to features. And I was, um, you know, I was, I was going around, I had all these opportunities. I was meeting with film four and BFI and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I had this, this very, this, this intimate low key Richard Linklatery kind of, um, first feature. And I was going and I was pitching like alien invasion movies and zombie movies and, and just, just kind of no one really knew what to do with me. So I, I had to, I had to go back and make a bunch of short horror films just so people could start to see me as the horror guy. It's, you know, it, it, it's kind of, um, it's a, you know, it's an ugly, it's an ugly word, but like, you know, you kind of have to establish what your brand is for, for, for people. Yeah. Um, cause people don't, people are fucking lazy. They don't want to spend the time, but not, it's not, it's not even laziness. It's just, they want to know what they're getting. You know, when you come into a room, they want to be like, Oh, I've got a, you know, I've got a 12 o'clock lunch with the horror guy. We're going to talk about making a horror movie. It's like, they want to know, they want to know where they're at. So I had to kind of like, position myself as that and and it was yeah it was like five years later uh when i made the short film dawn of the death and that that went to sundance and that was kind of like that was kind of a bit of a turning point because that started getting me tv work as well and like that started to kind of i started to feel like maybe i was worming my way into the industry whereas before i was just kind of on the sidelines waving my arms you know (laughs) and that's so that's how it was your own because obviously now you have done a few, you obviously host and then your next one is the horror mm. as well. That's how the horror thing started. That was something that you basically were like, that's what I want to do. So you, that was your own doing. Yeah. I mean, I've always loved, I've, I've always loved horror movies that they're, they're, you know, 
I've always, I've always, you know, to be honest, if I'm sitting at home and I'm reaching for a DVD, it's, you know, nine times out of 10, it's going to be a horror movie. So I kind of had this realization that what I was making and what I was watching, there was a disconnect there. And I, I you know, I, I, my taste goes from like really extreme art house to really extreme trash. So mm-hmm. I thought like, there's, there's probably an interesting place in between that I can live in. Um, and also just, you know, I, I, I kind of objectively looked, I was watching a lot of horror movies and I was like, there's a code here and I think I can crack it. You know, I think there's, I I kind of understand the language of horror because I watch so much of it. And I think I can, I think I can do this. And I think, you know, um, I think, I think to a large degree, I can do it better. And, you know, and I, and I was kind of interested in, interested in horror as, as being a very, like it's it's a very visual it's a very visual genre and the you know the reason coming from comic books coming from you know the the, the films that i that i made when i was a teenager the thing that always interested me was the visual communication of ideas like putting one image next to another image and that creating a meaning that's not that's not there in either of the images and you know it's 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 becoming increasingly um prevalent that movies will just have characters say the thing that the the filmmaker wants the audience to hear and it's just it's really grating to me because it feels like that's a misuse of the medium the medium should be about um pure visual storytelling you know at at its core um you know that's one of the things that, that that hitchcock would always espouse is is pure cinema and you know he'd have he'd have these wordless sequences like the you know the 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 murder in psycho or the the um the chase sequence in vertigo where for 20 minutes of the movie you'd have no dialogue but you'd totally be following everything that's happening it would be so much about about camera and composition and space and um and horror horror is the like as, as far as i can as far as i can think is like the only genre where an audience will blindly accept that you know you'll go into you'll you'll be sitting there in a in a cine world you know in a packed in a packed cinema and the audience will watch a sequence where that nobody speaks for 20 minutes because it's somebody stalking around the house with a knife, you know, whatever. And, and people think that it's low entertainment in some, in, in some respect, but I think it's almost like, you know, when it, when it's, um, when it's done really well, I think it's almost like the peak of what cinema can do is that, that kind of, um, that kind of wordless um, visual storytelling. Um, and I wanted, that's the sandbox I wanted to play in. So I was like, okay, horrors, horror allows me to do that. And if I do it well, I can find success and I can make money and I can not, you know, be homeless. So it, you know, it felt like, it felt like all of my interests kind of coalesced in, in, in horror. And horror is so sellable as well. Like you you see people making low budget, like horror films um, and, and there's an audience for it. Um, Whereas I don't know if that's necessarily true with some other uh, genres, but what, what have you got a couple of um, horror films that you could say were your favorites? well i mean so evil evil dead 2 i think is probably the one that i that i keep going back to like evil dead 2 was um great film film. so so good and so like uh it's like so directed as well like like i was watching that movie just when i was starting to kind of it was when i first got my camera and i was starting to work out um what a director does and how how you can use the camera to um to make people feel different, different things that a wide shot does a different job of a close up, that a wide lens does a different job of a zoom lens. And there's, it, it's such a masterclass evil dead too. And uh, uh, because, you know, because the directing is so, is so front and center, you can really pick it apart and kind of um, interrogate his decision-making. So I, I, I learned so much from, from evil dead too. And I just think it's like, it's, it's just, it's just a perfect, uh, it's just a per- perfect, perfect movie that I could watch again and again. I've probably seen it 50 times. Mm. Um, and then, you know, and then I, you know, and then th- there were movies like, I, you know, I, my, my parents tried to raise me without TV and without, you know, without violent movies. And of course, like that just made me want to watch the most violent stuff I could, <laughs> yeah. I could find you know, the most fucked up horror movies. And, um, and I remember that I remember, like I, I had I had VHS tapes of of all these nasty video nasty horror movies that I hid in my wall. I had this little pulley system with <laughs> this like this I, this grate that came off my wall, and I kind of like lowered these these VHS tapes into the wall cavity. 
and um and i'd be watching these movies these like fucked up fucked up you know violent horror movies and it, and eventually i'd kind of arrive at movies like hellraiser or the thing and i'd be watching them i'd be like i think these are good movies like i think these are actually good interesting like i think i think there's something else going on here you know i'm enjoying the gore but i'm also like there's something there's something that's being explored here that's 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 really that's really kind of well crafted and worthwhile and interesting and and um and it's like and there's a discussion of there's a discussion of things within the horror space that i'm not seeing anywhere else and um so i you know that's when i started to kind of treat horror with a bit more respect and, and a bit more kind of um uh you, you know i started to kind of i started to, to to want to pick apart the language of horror a bit more and the thing is like <laughs> It's just one of the best horror films ever made, and yeah. everything about it—the visual effects and the, the just the atmosphere that it creates. Mm. Um, for me, it's a bit like it's up there with like Alien, and and yeah, it's just, it's the yeah, it's just there's a vibe to it that when you're watching it, it's not like any other movie. It's um, oppressive. It's yeah. so it's so well crafted. I mean, it, it, John John Carpenter. I think you know you say like you you put it in the same category as Alien, which I absolutely would. I think I think Aliens Aliens like a perfect movie, yeah. but um, but it's just like it really fucks me off that John Carpenter kind of he kind of doesn't get get mentioned in the same breath as a lot of those filmmakers that I think he stands shoulder to shoulder yeah. with. You know the Spielbergs and the um, you know um, the Scorseses. Uh, he's uh, he, you know, he, he, he had such a run of, he had such a crazy run of movies, from like Halloween all the way to like, I don't know, In the Mouth of Madness. There's like basically not a dud movie in there. Mm. And it is, it's that weird thing that there is in some circles that stigma that, oh, you know, horror film, that's easy, that's, it's horror, it's trashy. But yeah. like, as you say, things like the, things like the thing <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Alien. I mean, Alien's kind of its own separate thing almost, isn't it? It's, yeah. I think some people don't see that even as a horror because it's because it's slow burn, I guess, and because yeah. it's um and I guess because it's a lot of people because <laughs> Yeah, but it's also because a lot of people like it. And as soon as a lot of people like it, it's not horror. You know, that's the way that we talk about horror. It's like Silence the Lambs isn't a horror, but it totally is. That's but a, because... yeah, same thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's weird yeah. that I love those films though. Like uh yeah. there's just there's nothing better than sitting down and watching something like that, which it's just completely consumes you. And even mm. now, like you think alien 1979, you think it looks still looks incredible. It still yeah. looks amazing. Ridley Scott fucking knows how to shoot. <laughs> yeah. Although then, you know, slag of Ridley Scott. I love Ridley Scott, but alien was so good. And then if you watch say alien covenant, I enjoyed yeah. it, but it's just yeah. not the same thing. Like, and no, I know, lightning doesn't strike twice but um mm. yeah. yeah it's kind of crazy some filmmakers some filmmakers are just, you know not saying Ridley scott's like this but some filmmakers just have they have they have one or two films that are that, that, that only they could only they could ever make or that could only happen in that way at that at that time um and like yeah they and, like, don't need I, any I, other films though <laughs> no and, I, like, and yeah exactly because you check and you change the genre as well like you know nothing you're never you're never going to make a movie like like alien alien kind of define the way that that we shoot sci-fi movies the way that we um you know the same way that like like after saving private ryan like nobody ever shot a war movie the same after saving private ryan um there you know there's some some movies that are just their turn their turning points it's undeniable mm -hmm. no definitely and you mentioned obviously the evil dead um am i right in thinking i mean obviously looking at your imdb and everything mm. else there was um it says that there's an untitled sam remy and <laughs> rob savage yeah. project can you talk about that is that something that's actually like, yeah yeah a it's, real it's, thing that's coming soon or it's it's in development at the moment we're just working on the script but it's um yeah like i first first time i came out to la i um had an idea that i wanted to pitch around and my my manager was like why don't we why don't we set you up with sam raimi it feels like something he'd you know he'd be interested in and so i you know i was i was flying over to la and like the the first day first day after i landed pretty much i had to go and do this 40 minute pitch to sam raimi which is wow. the scariest thing i've ever had to do but he i mean he's so he's so great and and um 
and kind of like responsive and he's like he's a lovely person to pitch to because he can he, he really gets into it you know he's really he just loves films and more than more than films he loves storytelling so he was really kind of um yeah he was he was really kind of uh great to great to to, to spin a story to and he loved the idea and he, he bought the idea in the room and wow. i started started developing developing that with him um and uh you know we, we brought a writer on to to um i kind of had this treatment and we brought this writer on that i've been working with and uh yeah no i mean I'm, it's it's really coming together well i'm hoping that we can shoot that one soon but um wow, it's interesting because like that that like that happened before that was off the back of like dawn of the death uh, maybe not quite no it was off the back of um salt this other short film that i did a couple of years ago so i've been working with sam for about a year before host came out mm. it didn't get announced until after but host is kind of like i when i look at host i see so much sam raimi in it um and and i think like so much of what i've learned working with sam i got to put to the test in in host and i was really thinking of host as like a way of it was like an exercise of of you know all these all these things that i think that i've kind of learned in theory from working on this project with sam let's let's put them to the test um because he's very all he's very audience focused his whole thing is like what's the experience that the audience is having right now and um and always always have that in the forefront of your mind it's like are you doing this for yourself and is this an ego trip or is this something that you know you're doing this because it's clever clever and you want people to think you're a good director or is this something that's going to give the audience the best most visceral experience um so yeah i'm always trying to like put myself to that test that must be mind-blowing though like as you said like the, the evil dead being you know those films being something you love and then being in the room with him and having to like pitch your idea that must have been yeah. pretty mind-blowing it was it was and it is and it continues to be but i think you know he's he's very good at um he's he's producing the movie and he's very good at letting uh you, you know he's he's very good at trying to understand what movie i want what movie i want to make and and trying to support that and trying to feed ideas through the kind of um through the lens of 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 that movie rather mm. than trying to impose you know he comes up with these great ideas these these amazing like very sam raimi ideas and you'd be like wow that could be in a fucking evil dead movie that's amazing and it, it, but he's very respectful of the movie that we're we're trying to make that's awesome, man. One of the um, one of the horror films. I I think of it as being a recent film. It's actually not that recent, but hmm. um, I can't remember. Did he produce it or did he direct it? Um, Drag Me to Hell. Yeah, he directed it. He Amazing. did direct it. I love that film. That film is one of those movies where you just yeah. go, "This is classic horror." Yeah. But you've you've managed to bring in an element of comedy, which just when yeah. it works, it's one of the best things because you're crying, laughing, just scared. Like you got yeah. a bit of everything in there. Nobody um, does it like him. No, nah, man. That was one of those films I remember seeing in the cinema and I was shitting myself, but then I'd be laughing the next minute. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a great, I it's actually, I need to, I need to watch that again. I haven't seen it for a long time. It, hold, it holds up. I watched it again last year and it's like, yeah, it's so, he's having so much fun as well. You can really <laughs> yeah. feel it. You can tell as well. I remember seeing it. I went to see it in the cinema and people just the audience were getting so involved with it and that doesn't yeah, always yeah. happen you know like yeah, people yeah. were like cheering and uh it's one of those movies but yeah I, i'd love to see a bit more of that i'm hoping mm. your your one with him will be something along those lines oh it's right? totally yeah. it's totally in that vein yeah yeah, yeah. oh brilliant <laughs> yeah that's perfect i mean that yeah insane what uh what an amazing thing just to have on a bit of paper you know in fact your name next to his and you're gonna yeah get you know crazy. hopefully do this project that's incredible what's um i mean the next process for you when you came off strings and you did all these mm. things you went into uh, you know obviously you had to make money and you had to go and do um uh, advertisements and, and music videos yeah. and and more shorts and and now you know you're at the stage where you've just the host is a fairly new film people have still got buzz around it yeah how did that project how did that come about from you know what how did that link up really? yeah you know because that was you know there was obviously a big gap between the last film you did um, yeah and film you did it was well you know it was it was it was there was that kind of like five-year recalibration process like i said after strings doing short films doing commercials yeah. and then you know the next big thing that i wanted to get into was television so 
off the back of off the back of um Dawn of the Deaf, my short film going to Sundance, I got I was able to land this super low budget TV job doing a kind of um this this one off Halloween TV movie thing for for Channel Four to kind of doc doc docu drama haunted house thing that we we shot the whole thing in four days. It was like an hour long thing. We shot it in four days. We had to like run around. I had to, I basically shot the whole thing on my iPhone first, and then we just shot exactly what we needed. To, you know, it was all pre. Wow. It was all yeah. Every everything was was planned out in advance, and um, you know, from there it was like that was it's 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 the catch twenty two of the industry is like you can't you can't get a TV job unless you've really done an hour of TV. So I had that had that hour of tv even though it was low budget and that 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 allowed me to um that allowed me to go on to to you know much bigger shows the next show i did was britannia which was this huge kind of roman epic show um that jez butterworth created and and you know the reason i the reason i was able to jump up to that bigger show off you know off the back of this this tiny little channel four thing was uh, james richardson from from vertigo films was the guy who picked up strings you know have five uh, six six years ago and had been staying in touch and he vouched for me and like gave me gave me way more control on my episodes of, of britannia than than um you know you're usually uh the, than you usually get in in television and so you know so it's kind of like fucking around in television for a little bit for for, for like four or five years and and um can i ask you, sorry yeah. i just wanted to ask there as well because that's mm. quite a big shift like what was that like then being given this this bigger budget and having a few more people kind of you know having yeah. their say like what, what was that like um it was like i think I, I like i really felt like i had like i felt like i knew what uh what they were what they were going for in with with britannia and i know like you know they'd be the first to admit it like that like the first the first season of britannia kind of like it, it was a set it was they were kind of discovering what the show was and they kind of they kind of like arrived at this vibe in, with the first with the first series and and I kind of came in and I was like I think I know exactly what what you want this to be and I know how we can you know I can nudge it that little bit further to get it there um and, it's, and I felt you know because because James knew me from strings he made sure that I had a, a voice at the table and uh you know and I just I I they 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 were happy with what I was getting and they trusted me and they just, they, they, they gave me, um, they gave me much, much more freedom on that than um, that, you know, they empowered me. It's a, you know, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot, but it, but I did, but I did feel like when I was there, we were doing big, big battle scenes with hundreds of extras. And, you know, I felt like, I felt like I had the tools to, um, you know, to, 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 to make, I had, the, I had the tools to, to to play around and arrive at something that we'd all you know we'd all be proud of, and not feel like I was having to second guess the whims of a showrunner or um, you know, or that I was just I was there as a kind of um, as a technician, you know, which is which is a you know that's 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 how, how the TV industry views directors. I think you know you know on, on a lot on a lot of things, um, and. You know, and the show, the, sh- the, sh- the show, the show is just a just a just a bit of fun, and I, yeah, you know, I had a really good time on it, and um, and then I didn't, and, I, and then I did a, did a couple more, did a couple more TV shows that I didn't that I didn't really, I didn't just didn't, kind of didn't feel creatively engaged with. Um, it just felt like like exa- exactly what you're what you're saying that um, it felt like uh. It felt it felt like I was having to please a please a room full of people rather than actually follow the you know, um, you, you rather than actually kind of craft something that 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 was my own, which isn't you know, that's the, I, I was I was being naive I think as well about thinking that TV was a space that that allowed for that unless you're you know, unless you're um, you know Kerry Fukunaga or something something like that you don't really you don't really get to do that in TV. And, the po- and learning the politics of TV is really useful. And learning how to work on a schedule and learning how to make your days and all the, all that kind of stuff is so like has served me so well going forward. But I, I was at the end of this like four or five year stint of just doing TV, feeling really fucked up and like just spun out about what I wanted to do with my life. Really, you know, I was I was um, I was thinking like, you know, I'm I'm 
on set and I'm working with actors and then playing with cameras, it resembles the thing that I, that I wanted to do when I was, you know, when I was starting out, but it's not, this isn't, this isn't it. And, um, and I was on this other show, which is again, a big, big sky show that I was kicking off. Um, and I was just like, just i was just was i kept expecting the creativity to kick in and it never did i was like i felt very much like a technician um and then luckily just before we started shooting the pandemic happened and we locked down and i was like thank god and i remembered like i was you know it was a couple of weeks into the into the lockdown and i was checking the 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 infection rates and I, and every morning I was hoping that they were going up so they wouldn't go back to this, this TV show. And I was like, that's fucked. That's not a good place to be. Like I need to sort something out. And, you know, so off the back of that kind of like weird creative funk, um, you know, to be able to do something like host, it really clarified things for me and kind of saved me in a way of, and um, it, 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 you know, it, it host came about, um just from fucking around on zoom with my friends you know like i was i was doing zoom i was doing a zoom um like a daily zoom drinks session with with a bunch of friends you know some of some of which i'd worked with before a lot a lot of film people um and i i played a prank on them one one day because i was bored and i wanted to just find some kind of like <laughs> some silly way of being creative in in lockdown so i so i i played a prank on them where i um I kind of convinced them that I'd been eaten by a zombie while I was investigating a strange noise on the Zoom call. I was like, you know, I've been hearing this noise in my attic. Will you guys, will you guys come up into the attic with me while I investigate? And I, I kind of created this, this thing out of cardboard that I sat on top of my laptop, which meant that I could be on my phone filming this, you know, on the Zoom call. And then, you know, I just cover the lens for a second and place the, place the iPhone into this cardboard slot I'd made. So it was filming my laptop screen. And then I press play on a, a pre-recorded video of, uh, <laughs> from, um, from a found footage horror movie called Wreck, where somebody goes up into their attic and a zombie jumps out at them. And I, um, you know, so as far as, as far as my friends could see, it was a seamless, seamless Zoom call where I went up into the attic and the zombie jumped out at me. And, and I, filmed, I filmed the whole thing and I, um, and I put it on Twitter and it ended up kind of like, blowing up in a you know in a very low-key way it went it went viral and people were enjoying you know the kind of lockdown specificness of it as well and and the, the zoomness of it and and then off the back off the back of that i got lots of people calling me being like you know is this a because they didn't realize it was a prank as well they thought people that the, the you know they thought that that the everyone was acting in it so so a lot of companies called me up and they were like you know is this a proof of concept for a larger feature do you want to do something else with this and people were people were throwing money at us not very much money but pe everyone was interested you know because nobody knew if we were going to be able to shoot anything for 2020 so um you know of course like when somebody when somebody says have you got a plan for something bigger you say yes of course i do and i didn't but i but i was like i'll work something out and and uh we yeah, we jumped on board with Shudder and just, just kind of set to work. And it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was great. It was like, it was the, the, the whole, the whole joy of it was just having something creative to do. That's hilarious, man. That's so funny. That's such a good story to like, I don't know. It's that that's a very different, that's not what I expected <laughs> to come <Yeah>. up. <laughs> Did you, your friends, when they were on the zoom call, were they all completely convinced then when you were doing that? They were convinced for like five seconds and then like after the zombie jumped out they all screamed and then were immediately like fuck you rob yeah, yeah. Um, but they're all the you know all the people who are in that zoom call they're the actors in host like they're it was <sighs> everyone who made host pretty much was on that original zoom call amazing yeah they could draw from a real experience <laughs> yeah yeah well exactly wow so that i mean that that is literally like you just kind of went, oh, I, that's going to be fun. I'll do that. And then so much came from that. It's amazing to think that that's, yeah. that's how it came about. It honestly, it honestly, like, it felt like such an easy win doing that yeah. movie because, because, you know, the way that I saw it was like, I'm not doing anything else. I'm just like, I'm just smoking weed and playing video games. And I can basically, I can basically, I've got to get out of jail card if this movie sucks because mm -hmm we're in a lockdown and we're doing it remotely and like i will get we'll get points for effort either way so it's not like i need to be precious about it mm. um 
And, you know, so what, it wasn't like something I went in with lofty aspirations, um, which, you know, which I think is why the movie's so fun to watch is because it, it was fun. It was really fun to make. And we wanted it to be, you know, we wanted it to be good and we wanted it to be scary. And we, we, you know, I was trying to make a good movie, but I wasn't, um, but I didn't feel burdened, burdened by it. Yeah. You didn't put the pressure on yourself. And I mean, there were a lot of movies as well during the pandemic that people went and made and you kind of feel like, you know, they're jumping on the bandwagon and they're like, oh, well, this is a good opportunity, but there were so many duds that came Mm. out of it. And um, that genuinely host is, it's one of the, like the ones at the top of the list. That yeah. you kind of like, well, no, genuinely, that would have been a good movie whenever it was made. It yeah. it, it wasn't, you know, that a lot of people went down the pandemic um, yeah. angle, didn't they? And it was a bit like, oh, yeah. Um, but it was such such a clever idea because it is you've restricted yourself in a way where it just makes total sense. Mm. Um, yeah, very, yeah, very clever. But um, but I think that's I think like like you, like you said that was what we were aiming for. It's like we. The aim was to make a beer and pizza movie that you could watch with your friends, where, yeah. you know, whether it's whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in person after the, you know, after the pandemic, it had to work. First and foremost, it had to work as a fun horror movie, uh, and and I think a lot of people made the mistake of trying to um, make a movie about the pandemic while we're still in the pandemic, and I think this it's so hard to get that kind of distance on something that's so world changing while we're while we're in the eye of the storm and we we just weren't interested in doing that at all it was all about it was all about how can we make a scary movie that that kind of like has a bit of the texture of this weird lockdown life that we're living through but isn't at all about the pandemic Mm. is there um i mean this obviously this podcast is all about you know inspiring young people like yourself when you were like 17 and you just made a feature yeah if you could go back and give yourself advice when you were 17 and you were making that film, um, what would it be? I think, um, I think I would say, like, I don't know, because, because, you know, because I think, I think, I think naivety is a really good, is a really positive tool. So I wouldn't, I kind of almost wouldn't, wouldn't want to gift myself with any extra knowledge um, because I think sometimes knowing how big and scary the industry is can deter you from just from just diving in and actually it you know when you when you learn when you roll your sleeves up and learn by by wading through all the shit like that's 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 the best way for it to not feel overwhelming I think but for me I mean if I was like if I was if I was in some some weird if some weird sci-fi situation where I was 17 right now and I was giving myself advice I would say I would say figure out, you know, play, play around, use this, you know, use the, um, use these kind of no pressure, fun, creative, um, short films and, and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you're doing before you enter into the industry proper, use that as an opportunity to figure out what you're interested in, mm. you know, what kind of filmmaker you, you want to be and don't, um, you know, don't, don't work backwards from, Oh, I want to be successful or I want to, you know, I want to win awards because, because like, that's the, you know, that's the least, that's the least interesting part of it. That was the least interesting part of host was, the, was the success of host and, and, you know, and, and, you know, the, 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 the thing that was so great about host was the making of it and, and um, just how, how kind of creative and electric that, that felt. And if you can, if you can figure out what that is, what makes you feel like you're, like you're, like you're present and you're in the room and you're in your element when you're making those short films it means that when you enter into the industry you can really um you can really kind of attack with confidence and you can say this is you know this what what you want basically when you're entering into these meetings is you want an idea of like this is this is what i want to make whether it's a whether it's a movie that you're that you're pitching or just like this is the kind of movie i want to make and then you want to have you want to have a short film or a few short films that are an example of you doing this really well, mm. you know, and that's, that's how you, that's how you win. It's really, as, it's really as simple as that. And there are other ways of doing it, but I think that's like, that's the surefire way of, um, of being able to, to get people to engage with you on, on your terms is by having, having something that really represents, represents who you are in a short form. Um, 
and I'd say, you know, and I'd say do horror. I'd say do horror because I think, you know, if, if you like horror, if you like horror and you understand horror, make horror because, you know, if you, even if you want to make a movie about something else, you can fold that into horror and, and bring an audience with it. You know, like I'm doing like Dawn, Dawn of the Deaf, my, my short film, which we're, we're making into a feature. Mm. I, like I've always, I've got deaf family members and I've always wanted to make a movie about the deaf community. Um, but if I, you know, if I was just making a movie about the deaf community, it would be, you know, it'd be a smaller, more art house release that would have a sm smaller audience. But Dawn of the Deaf is like a, 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 it's a zombie movie with deaf characters. So I met, you know, I'm able to, to explore those same things that I wanted to explore, um, you know, from the outset, but do it within, within the casing of this, of, of, you know, this kind of visceral zombie horror movie that's going to attract, you know, hopefully attract a wider audience. So I think do, do, do horror because you can do both within, within horror. Mm. Um, and there's a, there's a built-in audience. Um, and also what I'd say is like, really what you should be aiming for is to try and make, like a two minutes or under viral horror movie that, mm. that, that, that has a great jump scare and a cool high concept idea and shows that you can execute um, a scare really well, because that's, that's the quickest way. If, if, if what you want is to go and make feature films, that's the quickest way to, um, to jumping the queue basically, because, mm. you know, it goes viral, but it shows, shows that you can engage with an audience. It shows that you can handle scares. It's, you know, it's, it's how, um, David Sandberg jumped from doing Lights Out, which cost 200 quid, to, um, you know, to now he's doing the second Shazam movie. Uh, and, you know, in, in over the course of like three years or whatever, whatever mm -hmm. that's been, five years, um, you see it all the time. These like viral, these viral shorts that are under two minutes so you can share them on Instagram and Twitter and all that kind of stuff getting picked up by major studios. Like it's such a you've got a built-in audience now living, mm -hmm. living online. If you can engage, um, that's what I'd say. And that's, you know, that's, that's what we did with host as well, without knowing it, the prank, the prank was that two minute, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, viral short film that ended up, um, getting the feature made. Man, it's crazy, isn't it? Cause the, the landscape's changed so much. And as you say, there's, you know, there's so many different things coming out shows, films, everything else, Netflix, Amazon prime, all these yeah. things and trying to stand out now is is it must be really tricky to come up with that concept that idea and as you say with with um your prank it was it wasn't even intentional for it to be yeah. a you know thing um it's almost it's hard isn't it if you're kind of going right how am i gonna i'm gonna now i'm gonna come up with something that is gonna go viral like that's a tricky thing to do isn't it yeah um, and then just, the risk the risk is that it becomes cynical and people can, the, the other thing is that people can feel when it's cynical as well. Mm. You know, you've got to, if you're just trying to come up with something that's going to, that's going to grab people's attention, but you don't, you're not invested in it. People feel that as well. It's a weird thing. Yeah. That, yeah. It's a fine line, isn't it? Um, mm. And there's just so much comp competition. Um, but as you say, like you, you're, you're very into your horror. Um, mm. So it must come naturally those kind of jump scares but i yeah it's it's how do you it's how do you stand out yeah but i think you've got to be a fan first you've got to be a film fan first yeah it's hard, it's hard to say film fan first uh but you you, you know you you've the, the the way that i decide what i'm going to do is by thinking like what would i want to see as a as a horror fan like mm -hmm. what would what would make me leave my house and go to the cinema um and that's you know that's as, as good a barometer as any i think mm -hmm. Well, it's like high concept, um, like what's that film called? Um, is it Don't Breathe? Yeah. Like when that came out, the first one, um, just the idea of it is fun. Straight yeah. away, you're like, okay, cool. I get it. I get it straight away. Um, yeah. And it's that kind of thing, isn't it? Where you, you just want to, it's like with anything, People, you want to put it in yeah. a box and go, okay, I know what that yeah. is. Which is, which is, you know, it's, it's, um, Again, it's, there's a way of looking at that that that's cynical, and it, it you know it isn't it is in a way, but but I but I feel I, I see it as like I see it as like a transactional thing, mm -hmm. you know the same like if you if you create if you kind of work under the banner of a high concept that people can understand within ten seconds, you know that's why they say elevator pitch, which again mm -hmm. is a horrible term, but like you know if you can be like 
a bunch of people break into a blind guy's house and he turns the tables on them. Like that's a great high concept. I'm like, I want to watch that movie. That sounds fun. Um, you know, if, if, if you, if it kind of puts you ahead with the audience because they know, they know, um, they know, and they understand the, the plot which is really the least interesting part of it, you know, and then, and then it gives you just more time to play and more time to do the interesting stuff. You know, if the audience understands what the, you know, what the movie is in a very basic way, it means that you can invest in character or moments of, you know, surprising, surprising, intimate, intimate human moments. You can weave in, um, you know, th something thematic that, that would will take people by surprise. You can just spend your time crafting, scares and um you know like well i mean don't like don't breathe is so technically accomplished it's such an incredible incredibly visual movie mm. and he you know Fede alvarez has such fun with that movie because you because you know exactly what you know you know exactly what you're going in for and then he's then he, he it's just a playground for him from from there on out yeah i mean it's it's, it's as you say the minute you you kind of go i get it and now the mm. rest is just playing with that idea and the audience is on board straight away. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like, a, I don't know if, did you see It Follows? Yeah. yeah. Another one where straight away you're like, I get it. Cool. Great mm. concept. Um, I don't, what did you think of that film? I love it. I mean, I think, I think It Follows, it, it has that idea that you, that you totally get from the offset. And then, and then, you know, what you can't, what you couldn't elevate a pitch is, the style, the approach, the atmosphere, the sense yeah. of dr the sense of dread and nightmare logic that that movie achieves. Um, again, that's what's that's what that's the most interesting thing about it. But it hooks you it hooks you in with something that's really simple. Mm. That I mean, I just straight away I just think of I remember watching that for the first time in that opening sequence, which is yes. quite literally the camera just spinning round on the street, mm. and it's I yeah. think it's like a three sixty. Yes. And and you're going, oh my god, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? And you're like leaning yeah. into yeah. it, and then it's a person jumping on a trampoline. But you're like yeah. so tense, you're like, what the hell's going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a great, it's a great film. Yeah, but that and that film fucks movies. that film fucks so much with lang with with film language as well because like you know horror like mostly famously lives in the close-up you know it's all about crash zoom in on a bloody you know stump or like it's all very um you know you build tension by by going close up on the door handle close up on a hand reaching for it like it's not horror is not played as much in the wide shot wide shot is more you know it's like chaplin said that you know wide shot is comedy a close-up is tragedy and <laughs> it's you know same same thing goes for horror but that film plays so much in wide shot and that opening scene is a case in point that it's just mm. this very slow, detached, uh, you know, objective um, g camera, but it creates such a sense of dread. And um, yeah, again, like, the, you know, the, the high concept is the least interesting thing about that movie. It does so mm. much, so much that's interesting. Yeah, it's a great movie. Um, Rob, this has been great. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on. And um, no, I really appreciate it because I know you must be, you must be busy and yeah. Um, dealing with the time difference and everything else but um i wanted to ask one last thing yeah. it's a kind yeah. of a tradition um is there a moment that you can share with us that <laughs> was just humiliating something on set something like i mean you're when you were saying yeah. that you know when you were doing strings and and most of the people didn't pick up their phone that's that's pretty up there um but is there a moment that you can kind of share with us that that rivals that something that humanizes yeah. you <laughs> uh, humanizes me i mean like most days most days are kind of are kind of embarrassing like i used to the thing is the thing like when i start when i started out after after strings i started working on kind of like professional sets i would um you know like i'd get i you know especially especially working with actors like that's that's something that's something that i really had to kind of um I had to get better at figuring out that language because it wasn't technical in the way that, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't pick up a camera, you know, like you, you pick up a camera, you figure it out. And, you know, mm. there are certain principles and it's, I suppose there are certain principles that, 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 that it, you know, in the way that you talk to actors, but like I'd get tongue, I get tongue tied with actors or I'd get like, I'd get anxiety or I'd get, um, you know, I just get, I just get, get, get flustered and, and kind of, um, uh, yeah, like, you know, I, 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 I was kind of coming off coming off strings which had a, had a bit of success 
and going onto these sets that were totally different because I'd never run a set like this. I'd never been on a professional set and just having to like pretend like I knew what was going on. Um, yeah. It was like, it was a constant, it was a day by day humiliation of just like <laughs> having to, having to act like I belong there. And I was a kid as well with all these like kind of grizzled industry professionals. And the thing, the thing, like what I would do, which, which is really this about staving off embarrassment is like, so that I didn't get tongue tied or flustered or, or, or you know, have, a, have an anxiety attack. I, if I didn't, um, sometimes I'd be watching a take and something just wouldn't quite be right and I didn't, if I didn't know exactly what the thing was straight away, if I couldn't go to the actor and be like, um, you know, I think, I think this, I think we need to cut this line or, you know, whatever. If I didn't have like a fix, um, I just wouldn't say anything. And I, and I'd hate it. And there's lots of early stuff of mine that I'm like, oh, fuck, there's something wrong about, there's something wrong about this. And we could have worked it out. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I didn't want to go up to an actor and seem like an idiot you know, I didn't want to go up to, to anyone and, and seem like I didn't know what I was doing. And I was so, um, you know, I, was, I, I felt like it was the director's job to have, always have, always have the answer. Mm. And at a certain point, you know, at a certain point, a few, you know, a couple of years, a couple of years in, I decided, I just kind of made a promise to myself that if something feels wrong, I'll go up and I'll just start talking and I'll start, I'll start talking even if I don't know what the solution is and I'll go over and I'll be like, ah, something's not right, you know? And, mm. and, and it, and it, and it really like eased off my anxiety and it eased off my, um, like it, it, I, I, I kind of feel a bit more bulletproof to being embarrassed now on set because I'm so, I feel so comfortable now being like, I don't know what the thing is, but I know that I, I know how, I know how I feel again as the first audience to this movie. Um, mm. So I'll go, you know, I'll go up to an actor and I'll be like, something's not working here, is it? And, you know, and sometimes they have to be like, oh, it feels pretty good to me. And I'll be like, oh, okay, well, th this is the, this is the point where I started to feel like, you know, and through, through conversation, through collaboration, you realize what the thing is. And sometimes it's just like, sometimes it's just like everyone wants you to say it because you're there, mm. you're there nodding and they're feeling like something's not, not yeah. quite working. You know, you want somebody who's going to, who's going to turn up and be like, you know, they're going to, they're going to acknowledge the elephant in the room and be like, that's not, that's not quite hitting it. You know, what is it? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's like any, anything that just, that just, that just makes everyone want to huddle together and be like, we've got to, we've got to make this movie. We've got to fix this thing. It's on us. Mm -hmm. It's not on, it's not just on, not, not just on you. Well, you're on um, the same team, aren't you? So it's, it's, that is, you've got to remember it's a collaboration and, um, yeah. I, I mean, I wrote and, and, and directed a, a short, eight minute thing a while back now and and it was the first thing i ever directed and i nearly i nearly bottled it at the last minute and got my mate yeah. who had directed stuff before he was the first ad i nearly went oh can you just do it and yeah, and i'll, yeah, I'll yeah. just kind of watch and i'm glad it didn't because you know you kind of as you say you just learn as you yeah. go and and it is that embarrassment of like i'm gonna go up to the actor now and be like uh yeah something's not uh you don't you don't I felt like an idiot and I, so I totally get what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. Especially when you're starting out, you're kind of like, who am I to tell them that something's yeah. not right? It's, it's a, a really, it's but a if really you're talking, one. yeah. But if you're talking about, if you're talking in terms of feeling, it's not, you can't, you kind of can't deny that, that, you know, yeah. so I was, I was trying to talk in terms of like, what do we want the audience to feel? What do I feel? Like, I don't, you know, I feel like this scene needs to, to be more tense or I feel like there needs to be some, some, you know something kind of bubbling under the surface here or whatever mm. whatever, whatever whatever bullshit it is but like um but because it because you you know you forget as well when you're behind when you're behind the camera that 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 it's you know it's an equally lonely process for the for the actor as well you know especially if they're there um not getting not getting feedback or doing something that, that, that doesn't feel like it's um like it's quite hitting mm. but everyone else is acting like it's like it's fine like you know to anything anything to make you feel less like you're on different islands mm -hmm. is um you know it, it's exactly what i was what i was fearful of and what made me look like a tit so many times <laughs> but actually but actually by doing by doing the thing that i thought would be um you know like like i never want to show my face again kind of level embarrassing is actually is actually is actually the thing that kind of like bulletproofs me from from being embarrassed a lot of the time on set yeah well, it's just a conversation, isn't it? It's something when once it's out there and you're discussing it and you realize you're on the same side, it's like, OK, 
hey, let's just sort it out and chat about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And if they think I'm an idiot, then that's fine. But at least I'm like, at least I'm, at least I'm saying how I'm, how I'm feeling. And that's literally, that's literally your own, your only job. Mm. It was not and literally you, your only job, but yeah. <laughs> and you're not going to sit there and watch it in the edit and go, oh, yeah. What have I done? You'll, like, you'll figure it. Done. You'll figure it out in the edit. You'll, you know, you'll be like, oh, it's, it's this thing. I should have mm -hmm. just said. I should have just said something. Um, but yeah. So 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 just just kind of not being not being afraid of like throwing yourself out there without having without having an answer, which you know, which potentially will open you up to to more embarrassment. But from my experience uh helps alleviate that <laughs> i think that's a good that's a good positive note to uh mm. to finish on but no thanks right. man i really appreciate it it's, no no this was fun it's really interesting and um it's such a it's such a it's not the story i was expecting and that's why i love doing this it's it's yeah. always fun to talk to people and see you know what their angle was and how they mm. how they got to where they are and um yeah it's really interesting man so thank you yeah no great questions it's a cool thing you're doing uh, it's, it's nice to have a chat, isn't it? And it, it keeps you keeps you sane if you're you're kind of like waiting for the next phone call or whatever. So yeah, um, it makes me well, feel again, like I've got my toe in. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the same. It's the same thing we were we were just talking about. It's like it's it's all you know. All of this is just about not feeling like you're like you're alone in your experience, you know. Mm -hmm. And any, anything that anything where there's there's overlap or just like tell me i'm not feeling crazy it's because it's it does it's yeah. an industry that makes you feel like you're going fucking insane most of the time 100 percent, and that's that's the tricky thing isn't it when you know you're new to the industry and i mean as you say being green and being naive to it and having that that arrogance of youth when you start yeah. it's so important because if you started totally. where you are now and you're unsure and going oh it's gonna be really hard and there's all these like things to get past yeah. Um, you need that to start with because the beginning is difficult. Um, yeah, yeah. You don't, don't want to see how you want. It, it's got to feel. It's got to feel easier, achievable. <laughs> it's got to feel no, achievable. Nobody would. Sure. Nobody would. Nobody would do it. <laughs> exactly. All yeah. right, man. Well, um, I'll let oh. you go. And uh, what? By the way, I was yeah. <laughs> while I was talking to you. Obviously, I was looking. I was like, "What the fuck is that? It's a coat on the door." But I was thinking it's it was going to yeah. be like a host moment where it was going to start moving <laughs> or some shit. I was doing. I did my. I did my Toronto introduction, and I like I rigged everything up with fishing wire so that that cross flew off the wall in the doll's house. Oh, amazing! And the, and the cupboard slammed. But um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't do it this morning. Uh, I mean, the doll's house as well is kind of creepy. It's super creepy. Yeah, yeah. I was. I was, was this all like, there when you? I'm guessing you were staying somewhere and all these is, your things you put in. This is my no. This is my girlfriend's house in in LA, and like she's she's a believer, and she found she got given I think this doll's house, and I was trying to like renovate, or I was, I was trying to like re, you know, I like make it look pretty and gave up halfway through it's just like a little hobby um so now it just sits there all creepy looking no it's a good background i really did think that maybe some at some point something was going to happen <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right man well i'll let you go cheers. and um yeah cheers for this mate take care no worries man. thanks man see ya Bye. thank you to our guest rock dash cam is out in cinemas and on demand on the 3rd of june in post-production now is an adaptation of Stephen King's The Boogeyman Night Terror, and in development is the untitled Sam Remy, Rob Savage Project. Support us on Patreon for early access to episodes, and follow us on TikTok. If you enjoy this episode, please like and subscribe. If you have time, write a review. It all makes a huge difference. Thank you. It's a life and, fail, and you better come back next month to a life and fail.